Good evening. I'm Alexander Rose. I'm the executive director here at Long Now. Um, this June, we hit the one year anniversary of the interval. Thank you. And uh, as many of you know, we also have a, a nearly weekly speaking series going on there. And a, a good friend of Rama's is speaking next week, Hugh Howie, uh, of the Wool series. Uh, and that series continues to, uh, to go on. And I think um, it's, a, it's a kind of a more intimate version of these talks. And I encourage you to come when you can. Our, our seating limiting uh, is, a, is a bit more of a factor there, uh, but eventually I hope we can get you all in. Uh, the other thing I wanted to let you know about is that um, many members have taken advantage of the fact that we have a members discount. How many of you are members in the room? Right, so you all get 10% off during the day and uh, all evening on Monday nights. Um, and then we also do uh, special events there. So if you want to hold a special event, usually up to about 30 people, um, we can certainly do that. And then in the back uh, small room, uh, we can do meetings all day or evening for up to 10 if you're really cozy, usually about six or eight. Um, so anyway, please, uh, please do come by for any of those events or for doing your own event. And for tonight's long short, this is only a one minute long short. And uh, since Ramas is going to be kind of talking about the 2.0 version of humans, uh, I thought that a long short that gets you right up to 1.0 is what you needed. Enjoy. Reality's pace doesn't change as much as we change it, I notice. Um, the story, hi, I'm Stuart Brandt from the Long Now Foundation, and um, it's worth occasionally mentioning how speakers come to the series. In this case, our speaker tonight was suggested to me by uh, Shel Caffin, who's one of the earliest and longest and deepest supporters of the Long Now Foundation, and especially of the series. Thank you, Shel. And uh, Shell ran into the speaker at Foo Camp and found him holding his own with a challenging group there. Uh, suggested I take a look at the fiction, so I did. And the Nexus series uh, got me into it so much that I was sort of dancing around waiting for the third of the trilogy to come out, which it just did. And as, if you haven't read it, it's outside. And I knew we had something. It's interesting when you ask ordinary fiction writers to speak, they mostly talk about literature. When you ask science fiction writers to speak, they talk about the world. <laughs> and that's why I think we get so many of them in this series. 
they grasp with delight and make us grasp with delight. Time past, time present, time future. Rami is now. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Stuart. And uh, I also have to thank uh, the supporters of Long Now and Hugh Howey, who was ultimately the guy who uh, emailed me and said, hey, Stuart wants to know if you want to do a, a Long Now talk. I replied in about two seconds flat saying yes. Um, this is a bucket list experience for me, actually. I've been a member of Long Now for a long time myself. All right. So I'm going to talk about how technology can change us, how we're choosing to use technology to change us, and talk about the various ways people fear this, and why mostly, I think, while we should pay attention to those, mostly this is for the better and not for the worse. I am a science fiction writer. I also write nonfiction, but science fiction is really what I'm known for and my love. And as Stuart was saying, this really is the literature of ideas. It's literature about what has happened and what might happen. Now, in my science fiction novels, the, the central technology is called Nexus. It's a drug you swallow that gets into your brain, little nanobots attached to your neurons, and transmit what your brain is doing via Wi-Fi and can receive. So it's a technology that, if two people have it, they can share what they're seeing, what they're thinking, what they're feeling, even their memories. And if 10 people have it, so can they, and so on. Now, this might not be a totally novel idea to you. You might be familiar with this idea if you're up to date on the latest and greatest in modern American philosophy, especially the work of great American philosophers like Keanu Reeves. <laughs> Right? who famously, when knowledge was beamed into his brain, said, I know Kung Fu. Right? Now, there are really two different views of human enhancement, making us superhuman. And the one that we've heard most about, actually, is the genetic path. Genetically engineered babies who are smarter or stronger, or maybe just tall, blonde, and blue-eyed. And the other is the cyborg path, which is... I read about both, but more the latter. So I want to dive into both of these, and then a third sort of mystery uh, approach as well. So let's start with this idea of genetically improving ourselves in some way. Richard Dawkins was asked if he could use one word to describe biology. The word he chose was digital. Biology is information. In fact, DARPA has a new uh, lecture series where they say biology is technology. There's a code that programs a lot, not all, but a lot of who we are. And like other digital technologies, the technology of reading and writing and manipulating genes is on an exponential path to improvement. The white line here is Moore's Law. You all know that. This is a log scale. So this is an incredibly rapid progress of Moore's Law. The green line is the cost of gene sequencing, and it's going even faster. There's actually nothing we can quantify in terms of progress that is faster than the pace of gene sequencing and genetic science. It cost $3 billion to sequence the first genome, and now we're on the cusp of getting the $1,000 genome. And that means that there's huge potential progress. Now, to do something with that, we also wonder how you manipulate the genome, and we're getting better and better at that. How many of you here have heard of CRISPR? This is in the news a bit. This is the latest and greatest gene editing technology. It's not the first, and it won't be the last. But it allows scientists to, at a lower cost than ever before, and with a high degree of precision, say, go find this gene sequence and replace it with this gene sequence. Basically, search and replace is what it is. And it is opening up new venues and new avenues of manipulating all sorts of things. Here's an illustration. I've never actually seen a scientist with a pair of scissors and a model of the genome, um, but you can kind of get an idea of what it's like there. Now, if we understand what genes do and we can manipulate them, that leads up to the question of could we change them? Could we say take a, an embryo that's just been fertilized, that's no more than eight or maybe 16 cells, and go in there and do a little uh, search and replace on the genes that are inside of that? Now, this would have to be an embryo, is how we normally think of it, because by the time it's more than a handful of cells, it's nearly impossible to reach all of them. So this wouldn't be a natural pregnancy. This would be a, an in vitro fertilization 
pregnancy. But then in theory, you do this, you do your search and replace, and nine months later, you'd have a little baby that had different genes than he or she was conceived with. And there's lots of reasons that people might want to do this, right? Height, 87% genetic. Right? The rest is nutrition and so on. IQ, the low estimate is that IQ is 50% heritable, and the high estimates are higher than 70%. Uh, personality traits. Psychologists talk about the big five uh, traits of personality, and these all have heritabilities ranging from 40% to 60%. So these are all things you could potentially manipulate. If you want to get a sense of how wide the scope is of what we could do, consider well, these numbers or consider more broadly what we did to another species. We took wolves 20,000 years ago and started interbreeding them. We didn't add any new genes, we just selected from the population of genes that were there. And the outcome, after a thousand or so generations, maybe 2,000 generations, ranged from uh, dogs you can put in your purse to mastiffs. Right? That is the power of just reshuffling and choosing among the genes that are already in a population. Now, there's also the possibility of doing something more radical. Right? We've all seen the X-Men movies, they read the comics. What if we could take a gene that doesn't exist in humans at all, or exists very scarcely, and insert that? Or, in some cases, scientists take an animal that has uh, one or two copies of a gene and insert a third copy, and that can sometimes increase the function of this gene. Right? There are known examples of this. Here's a mutant. Iro Montiranta in the 1964 Winter Olympics took home five gold medals. His uncle is also an Olympic gold medalist at another endurance sport. This is in part because he has a genetic mutation to a gene called EPO. EPO tells your body to create more red blood cells. So people who have this very, very rare genetic mutation just produce a lot more red blood cells. They have more cardio capability. Right? Or here's another uh, uh, mutation in nature. Is this some GMO bull? Not exactly. This is a Belgian blue bull. They've existed for a couple hundred centuries, a couple hundred years, sorry. And they have a mutation in a gene called myostatin that causes them to build about twice as much muscle mass as other bulls. And in fact, we now know of five or six such genes that can massively increase muscle mass in all sorts of animals and probably would in humans, too. Or this ordinary-looking mice is a Doogie Mouse, named after a Doogie Hauser MD, if any of you remember that show. <laughs> I didn't name him. The scientist who created this, Joel Chen, uh, chose that name. The Doogie Mouse has a mutation in a gene called NR2B, and that mutation means that it learns faster. The synapses in its brain uh, solidify faster. Its neurons grow more connections more rapidly. Things that it takes five repetitions to teach a normal mouse, you can teach a doogie mouse in one repetition. And the same genes are active in learning in the brain, in the human brain. So we could potentially uh, use this technology to make ourselves far smarter, or at least far more able to learn. There's a whole host of more science fictional scenarios that aren't that hard. Every pigment you see in nature, every color you see on a plant or animal is created by a gene or a set of genes that encodes for some protein. There's no reason that humans couldn't have these, maybe selective in certain parts of the body. Why can some animals regenerate lost limbs and not humans? It's due to genetic differences they have, genetic programming that kicks into play a new program when a massive trauma occurs. In theory, humans could have that too. Even aging. Not all species age at the same rate. Trees, the oldest tree alive is about 4,700 years old. Uh, even animals, 250 years for the tortoise. Over 200 years for the bowhead whale, a mammal that we share about 95% of our genome with. Right? And at 150, the bowhead whale is still going strong. Some of us might like that, a slowed rate of aging. So all of these are scenarios that have seemed like science fiction until in April, a team of Chinese scientists published a paper saying that they had taken human embryos and actually genetically modified them. These were embryos from a fertility clinic that could not ever uh, grow to uh, full term. They had various other problems. And they did it to remove a disease. They snipped away a disease gene. Nevertheless, the response was a lot of... Uh, <laughs> 
this, basically. We're headed for a world of sort of stultifying conformity and where the powers that be uh, clamp down on you if you don't have the right genes, right? Or uh, if you go further back, what is Gattaca, but sort of a remake of Brave New World in some way? I thought Gattaca was great, actually. Um, though wrong in the science, as I'll discuss in a second. But again, Brave New World is about the use of breeding technology to create a culture of great conformity, of great centralized control, and that's one of the big angst that people have about genetic technologies. The other angst is about equality, and it's legitimate. If uh, the poor can't afford this technology, or the masses can't afford this technology, but the super rich can, will that give them further advantages to pass on? Will the species even bifurcate in some way? Okay. So in response to this Chinese study, this is Francis Collins out of the NIH, he said the NIH will not fund any studies that involve uh, engineering of a human embryo, even to address disease issues. I actually think this is short-sighted, and I'll, I'll tell you why. There's actually a lot of challenges to getting this technology right. Okay? One of the first ones is that CRISPR, as awesome as it is, has errors. The Chinese researchers managed to make about four embryos that had some of the genes they wanted in them out of 50 that they tried. They actually destroyed more than half of the, those 50 uh, accidentally in the process, and they inserted genetic errors into the rest. So the technology is still quite a ways from being uh, uh, ready for prime time. The other is that even though so many traits are strongly genetic, they're genetic in very, very complex ways that might surprise you. IQ, more than 50% genetic, but the top 69 genes involved in IQ seem to drive about 8% of the variation in the bell curve. There are probably at least 500 genes that are involved, and maybe more than that, maybe thousands. Personality, those big five personality traits, again, thousands of genes, and no one of them makes up more than a fraction of a percent of the variability. Height, you'd think height was simple. Right? It's a very simple, straightforward trait. But to get 8% of variation in height, the papers say you have to find 697 genes to tweak. So these are not easy, especially if every tweak imposes some chance of doing something wrong. There's also the possibility of side effects. Side effects of missing a gene, because no technology will ever be perfect, will get some things wrong. But others. Iromantiranta, that EPO gene mutation, people that have that are at higher risk of heart attacks because their blood can get so thick with red blood cells that it becomes difficult for their heart to pump. You see uh, bicyclists who dope with EPO. Uh, several years back, a number of them died all in one year because they'd all kind of gone a little bit too far in that. IQ, the single gene that has the biggest influence on IQ in humans, if you turn it into its high IQ state, maybe a third of a point, perhaps, you also increase your risk of schizophrenia. <laughs> the doogie mice learn really, really fast. They also seem to remember pain for much longer and much more intensely. So I'm not saying any of these are undoable. We will probably eventually move into all of these. But if you think about the priorities of parents in today's day and age, you think about, oh my gosh, is my kid uh, getting enough time in the dirt, too much time in the dirt? What about the gluten? You know, do I have to worry about the peanuts? Is a peanut-free uh, table at school? That's good. <laughs> parents are highly motivated not around the newest, coolest thing for their unborn kid. I love this picture. I just found this doing some searches. The internet is awesome, right? <laughs> I have never heard a parent say this, except maybe when their kid was like six or seven and they were into a festival, okay? But not genetically. Um, so parents mostly want to reduce risk, right? And there are ways that genetic engineering could do that. A single gene change can cut your lifelong risk of heart disease by 40%. All right? Breast cancer. If you have a BRCA mutation that puts you at high risk of cancer, of breast cancer, or uh, ovarian cancer, there are single gene changes that could cut your lifetime risk by a factor of three or four. One change, not hundreds of genes. Alzheimer's disease. Similarly, a single genetic change can reduce the risk of Alzheimer's disease by 30%, or in people that have high risk variants, by much more than that. So it's actually quite hard or quite complex to enhance, but much simpler to reduce 
risk of diseases. And this is what will probably fit with uh, parental priorities. Right? Now, that's not to say that there isn't anyone who would like to take a risk. I mean, who would be willing to inject themselves uh, with some genetic change? It's people who are interested in exploring new states in various ways. You look and who's willing to do the most extreme things with their body or mind right now? It's adults in their 20s and 30s, typically, and they're willing to do things to themselves that they would never do to an unborn child of them. Now, an adult has trillions of cells, right? And so getting a new gene into all those cells is actually prohibitively difficult. But in some cases, we know how to do it to a small fraction of those cells. That's gene therapy. And in some cases, a small number of cells getting a new gene has a big effect. So in animals, they've been able to take an adult animal, an adult monkey, and inject a new gene that gives it boosted athletic performance for life or boosted strength for life. And so I think it's far more likely that we'll see adults use technology, genetically modify themselves, where they're more willing to take risks than they would be to modify uh, their unborn children. And rather than the Gattaca world of sort of crushing conformity, I think this speaks more to a world of people using technology for <laughs> self-expression or self-realization. None of these people are genetically modified, obviously, but <laughs> at least I think. Uh, but people, when they're adults, are willing to use technology, anything from fashion to phones to computers, not to conform with society, though we all do some of that, but also to express and explore. Right? Now, there is this issue of cost and the gap between the rich and the poor, and could this widen that? But the interesting thing here is that the cost of biotechnology is dropping so rapidly, and biotech is really information. If you look at any drug that's made, or let's say a vaccine, which conceptually is not that far off in its, the ultimate complexity of making it from a gene therapy, it can take a billion dollars or more to do the research to develop such a thing. But then the cost is minuscule. Right? And in fact, the more people who want something in medicine, the cheaper it is. If you want a very high medical bill, get a disease nobody else has. Right? If you want a very low medical bill, get something that everybody else has, and then your, the costs progressively uh, get lower and lower. Right? This is information technology. So I think there's a possibility that that nature of it means that it will actually level the playing field. We can't be sure of that, but that's where I think the trend goes. Now let me switch gears. That was the biological path of enhancement, but let's talk about the cybernetic path of enhancement, the famous Keanu Reeves, uh, or Sergey Brin, who said uh, several years ago now, actually, we want Google to be the third half of your brain. I kind of like the idea of 1.5 brains, right? Now, there is an awful lot of work going into sort of the version 0.01 of Nexus, if you will, technology that interfaces with your brain to send data in or out. But it's not being driven actually by Google. It's being driven primarily by medical applications. This is a cochlear implant. Does anyone be here have a cochlear implant or know someone who does? I can't see you very well, so I'll assume that was a no. I saw one hand go up. This looks like a hearing aid, and it serves the same purpose, but it's not a hearing aid. This has a microphone on the outside, but some people can't hear no matter what. They have no inner ear hair cells left, so they can't pick up the sounds cleaned up and amplified that a normal hearing aid would pick up or would broadcast. So this cochlear implant picks up sound and then uses an electrode to directly digitally input that sound into the human nervous system. It stimulates the auditory nerve that goes then straight into the brain. This is actually quite old technology, this is the 1970s. And people thought it was impossible because the auditory uh, nerve fiber has 30,000 fibers. The brain, the auditory cortex, has more than a billion neurons. This thing has 23 electrodes in the best versions that we have today. But it actually restores uh, workable hearing and it has transformed the lives of 200,000 people alive today, like this uh, five-year-old girl hearing for the first time, or this six-month-old boy you're about to see uh, hearing the first sounds ever in his life. Here we go, it's coming back on, and he's back on again. See how he turns? Hi, Jonathan. Talk to us 
So Jonathan here is a cyborg. He has this wire that connects that connects to electronics and inputs sound data straight into his brain, well, into his auditory nerve, into his brain. But he's the cutest damn cyborg ever, right? <laughs> like, this is not that scary, ultimately. <laughs> And there's no way he could hear without this technology. So that's one form of input. How about another form of input? How about a sight? This picture appeared on the cover of Wired magazine more than a decade ago now. This is Jens Nauman, Canadian gentleman. Uh, he's 39 in this photo. At age 18, uh, when he worked on a railroad breaking rocks with his pickaxe, he accidentally hit a piece of metal, and a metal sliver came up and destroyed one of his eyes. The next year, at age 19, he was out snow snowmobiling, had an accident, and a piece of the clutch flew into his other eye. <laughs> he didn't want to compromise on his lifestyle. So he's blind in both eyes at age 19. Okay? And that goes on for 20 years until, at age 39, he is implanted with this device. This is a, a CCD camera on his uh, eyeglass there. It's kind of like the version in your, can in your cell phone, but way worse, because it's 10 or 12 years old now. It, that wire takes the data that comes in the camera, it would take it to a computer, one on his uh, hip that was about this big, now it's the size of a quarter. And then from there, that wire went up and into this jack in the back of his skull. Mm -hmm. 256 electrodes going into primary visual cortex, V1, back of the skull, back of the brain. Now, there's billions, multiple billions of neurons in visual cortex area one. So you wouldn't think 256 versus billions could actually work. Uh, but it produces what they call limited mobility vision. So that's what this looks like. I was able to very carefully drive and look from my left side to my right side, making sure I was between the row of trees on the right and the building on the left. And when I got near... Um, any obstruction in the front, I would see that there was an obstruction. I would also see the lack of obstructions. And then when I backed up, I would be able to um, inspect for obstructions there. It was really a nice feeling. It was really a nice feeling, yeah. So Jens doesn't have great vision. He doesn't have the system anymore. He didn't have great vision, but it was a quantum step up from zero. It's a proof of concept that we can take visual data from a phone or a camera, and insert it into the brain in a way that makes sense. And in fact, since then, uh, about a year and a half ago, the FDA approved the first bionic eye. It's called the Argus II. It goes a different way. It goes into the retina. But for tens of thousands of blind people, this will actually restore some semblance of vision. You'll start to see them around. Now, we've also gotten data out. This is a guy named Phil Kennedy, he's a neurologist in Atlanta, and this patient, Johnny Ray, had suffered a stroke and was completely paralyzed from the neck down. He had an emergency tracheotomy to save his life, so he couldn't talk either. All he could do to communicate was to blink, once for yes, twice for no. But Kennedy had done work in animals saying that showed that he could get data out of the motor cortex, the part that controls motion, and so the FDA gave him permission to do this in a human for the first time. And they did it via a wireless system. They did a surgery, implanted a system in his brain, sealed it back up, and then that system would speak wirelessly to the equipment in the rest of the room and even get its power that way. And it allowed Johnny Ray to go from just blinking to controlling a cursor on a screen and typing out messages to his friends and family. And about six months in, it was a very long training, but about six months in, they asked him, Johnny Ray, what does it feel like? And he typed out N-O-T-H-I-N-G. It had been very arduous at first, and then it just became another limb that he had, more or less. And this technology is advancing, too. So here's a, a more state-of-the-art version. 
You're watching the most advanced brain-machine interface in action. Kathy Hutchinson is paralysed and unable to speak, but just by thinking, she's able to control the movements of this robotic arm and drink her morning coffee. She's part of a pioneering study run by researchers at Brown University in the US. So Kathy's system has 48 electrodes, you see at the top of her head, uh, and with that, she can control a multi-axis arm. And this technology is getting better essentially every year. Uh, it does turn out that motivation is very important to her. Getting coffee was actually her second task that she chose. The first task that she chose was feeding herself chocolate. <laughs> and she always gets the chocolate in her mouth. It might be a little messy, but it always gets there. Right? We've also gotten data out of the visual system. So this is a study that put people in an MRI machine, an fMRI, and showed them videos of movie clips and then a piece of machine learning software that had been trained on brain scans and video clips, picked out from its own library of sort of fuzzed out videos which one looks the most like what they're seeing. So there, on the left is what the person is shown in the monitor, and from the right is what the algorithm, using their brain scan in real time, picks out as its best sort of approximation of what they're seeing. And it's very, very far from perfect, but just by scanning the blood flow in your brain, this algorithm can figure out roughly what sort of thing you're looking at. And that's a big handicap, not being inside the brain. With actual electronics in the brain, there's every reason to believe that this could be tremendously more precise than it is right now. Now, all of that is sort of uh, sensation, perception, uh, motion, but we're more than just things that move around and see things. We, have, we think, we feel, right? Can we affect these higher functions that we have? Who knows what movie this is? Uh, what's the name of the actor? What's the name of the character that he plays? <laughs> Lenny. Lenny! That's awesome. Wait, was that Molly? Yeah. That was my girlfriend. <laughs> well, thank you. It is Lenny. Right. So Lenny can't form new memories, and sometimes I wish that I couldn't either. But... This is an exaggerated version of what really happens, but things like this really do happen. Uh, and it happens primarily to people that have damaged a part of their brain called the hippocampus, a seahorse-shaped part of the brain that is vital in encoding new memories. But so scientists have been working on could they help the millions of people around the world that have some sort of deficit, usually due to trauma to the head of some sort. So at USC, a fellow named Theodore Berger and his team have developed what they call a hippocampus chip. It's a chip that gets shunted in sort of by bypasses in the brain around the damaged part of the hippocampus, and then it processes data in the same way the hippocampus is. In fact, they didn't even uh, really design this from the ground up. They, it's fair to say they don't even exactly know how it works. They're basically mimicking what hippocampus tissue normally looks like. And so they take rats that have this brain damage, and the rats cannot learn a maze. They run the maze, great. They try it on a second time, it's just as if they've never seen it before. With this hippocampus chip installed, the rats regain the ability to learn. And more than that, they learn better, and they get a new feature. They can run the rats through the maze and record all the data that goes to the hippocampus chip, and then a year later, it's about a third of a rat's life, it's called 30 years for a human, they can play back that session of data, put the rat in front of the maze again, and the rat runs it perfectly, as if it had just been there five minutes earlier. Right? They're able to store memories of at least some sorts, at least for rats. Right? Or <laughs> these adorable macaques have had a chip placed in their frontal cortex. It's a, a sort of a learning and attention chip, if you will, or even a, a monkey IQ chip. They've been trained after the chip is implanted on a monkey IQ test called a pick and match test. They're shown a bunch of pictures, then they're shown a very high speed barrage of pictures, and to pick the right ones and not the wrong ones. And the question here is can the chip improve their performance. The chip finds out when they get an answer right, when they get it wrong, and learns what patterns of brain activity look like for right answers versus wrong answers. 
Okay, great. Then they impair the performance of some of these monkeys on this test. They do that by giving them large doses of cocaine. <laughs> so the monkeys all think they're doing much better on the test, but in fact, they're, they're doing worse. <laughs> in those monkeys, when the chip is in an active mode, it can actually rescue the performance loss all the way. It can restore their performance as if they were unimpaired. And what's more than that, when they use this technology in a monkey that's not impaired at all, it boosts their performance on a 1 to 100 scale by about 10 points. Which leads, obviously, to the planet of the cyborg apes. <laughs> right. So all of that is fantastic, but the thing that that I guess I obsess over, the thing that my novels is really about and that I think is most transformative isn't just augmenting our ability, it's the ability to connect us. Uh, computers used to be things that you used for spreadsheets or word processors, right? But nowadays, that technology is used more than anything else to facilitate our communication. And that has changed and is changing the world. And there's work going on that shows that this is possible too. This is a study done at Wake Forest University by a guy named Sam Deadweiler and with uh, Berger, who did the monkey or the rat hippocampus chip. They have two monkeys in separate soundproofed rooms. The monkeys both have an implant in their auditory cortex, the part of the brain that processes sound. Those implants are connected, and so they play a sound for one monkey, and the question is, can the second monkey hear it? And yes, the second monkey hears the sound happen in the other room and can recognize what it is. Now, the top funder of brain-computer interface work in the world is the NIH, but the number two funder, and who funded this study, is DARPA, right? And it came out of a, a program that is focused, among other things, on can they improve battlefield communication between soldiers. Those who've seen with the internet, just because the military funds it doesn't mean that there aren't huge civilian applications. Or this study, this is done by a fellow named Miguel Nicolelis. They have two rats that have, both have implants in their motor cortex that controls their paws. One rat gets trained. They're in identical cages. The cages have lights that signal what lever they should pull to get food. But only one rat gets trained to learn what the lights mean. Okay, that rat can get the, the right lever all the time. The other rat has no clue. Until they turn on the connection between their implants, and then the second rat, who has never been trained on this, starts pulling the right lever. Not all the time, but about 70% of the time. Right? Now, Nicolelis, you can tell he's a sci-fi fan, because they didn't write this paper up as a neural connection between the motor cortex of two rats, blah, blah, blah. They wrote it up as a meta-organism of two rats and the internet. <laughs> okay? I like that. The other thing that is fascinating is where these rats are. Because one rat is at Nicolaitis' lab in uh, Duke University, North Carolina. The other rab, lab is in uh, his other lab in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Because once you make the contents of our minds digital, you can transmit it anywhere, right? Or at the University of Washington, about a mile from my home, uh, this study happened. It happened the day that Crux, my second novel, came out. So to thank them for the, the prompt... Uh, response there. Uh, they have no idea who I am, actually, but it just happened to be that way. These are two professors at the UW. They're in separate rooms, separate buildings, actually, across campus from each other. The one on the left, Professor Rao, is uh, playing a video game, and so is the guy on the right, Andrea Stoko. In fact, they're playing a video game together, but not a player versus player, and not cooperative mode. They're playing as a single player. And the way it works is Rao on the left can see the screen, but he has no keyboard or mouse. Stoko has the fire button, but can't see the screen. So when Rao wants to shoot, he thinks about it. You know, he wills the fire to happen. The EEG on his skull picks up that intent, transmits it across campus, and the magnetic stimulator on Andrea Stoko's head, stimulates the part of his brain responsible for his right finger twitching. <laughs> and it twitches, and he fires. Right? He doesn't, importantly, he does not uh, think, oh, Rajesh Rao wants me to shoot now, I should shoot. No, he just observes that his finger went down and he shot. Right. 
and uh, Berger et al., who did the hippocampus chip, are, have kind of speculated casually about what would happen if they had two rats that both had hippocampal chips and they connected them. Would the second rat learn to run the maze the first rat did? Would it suddenly say, hey, I know Kung Fu, or I know this maze, anyway? Probably not. There's a very, very, very long way to go to that, but it's still thought-provoking. But the challenges are also very real here. Let me not uh, to sort of sugarcoat it. I write sci-fi, so in sci-fi I can say, oh, magic nanobots, yada, yada, yada. It's a little bit harder when you're actually a brain surgeon. Right? So challenge one, anybody know what this uh, picture is? This is Lena or Lena. This is the most famous picture in, in image recognition. Actually, it's a classic picture that's been used many times to test algorithms. Jens, the blind guy, he sees in that rightmost version. Like his vision was a 16 pixel by 16 pixel grayscale. Right? It's a quantum leap up from zero, but you would not trade your eyes for the bionic eyes. Not right now, anyway, and probably not for a long time to come. Now, it'll get better and better over time. Uh, and the, we're heading into the left side of the bottom row with new technology, but it's still a very long ways short of human natural vision. Well, then there's this challenge. Who's interested in elective brain surgery? <laughs> yeah, I'm not. Let me just be clear. I'm not really either. Right? That has its risks. In fact, uh, this is what brain-computer interfaces look like today. Do you want one of these jammed into your skull? Now, just to... I'll be honest, like I was exaggerating a little bit. This is what it actually looks like. <laughs> but those are sharp. You still probably don't want them uh, being jabbed into your skull. So there are many who say, look, this stuff will never really happen. It'll happen for the paralyzed, for the brain damage, but it'll never reach uh, the point people will electively choose to use this technology. Okay. But we used to also say that eye surgery would never become common. You would never have someone using a scalpel uh, to you know, change your eye. You don't always wear glasses anyway. Uh, but technology changed that. The Exomer laser allowed us to do something called LASIK, and it went from being 10 or 20,000 eye surgeries a year to 2 million eye surgeries a year, almost all of which are elective. It's not perfect, but it was cheap enough, safe enough, and fast enough that a lot of people have chosen to go this route. Now, is there a LASIK for brain surgery? That's a tall order, but there are things that sort of approach that. Uh, why do I have a picture of a fish here? This is a zebrafish. And if you like neuroscience, it is a great time to be a zebrafish. Right? And the reason is, with zebrafish that have been genetically engineered using something called optogenetics so that their neurons light up in response to firing and are light sensitive, uh, with a combination of that plus new techniques of microscopy, we've been able to do amazing things. This is a video of a zebrafish brain firing in real time. It's something we've never been able to do to any organism before now. This is about two years old. And then more recently, Ed Boyden's group at MIT amped up the resolution, and they produced videos like this. This is fast enough resolution, or fast enough time resolution, and good enough spatial resolution that we are seeing every single time a neuron fires in this uh, young zebrafish. Right? The zebrafish is actually in a, in a virtual reality rig. It's kind of stuck in place. It's got a screen. And on the screen, they show it uh, pictures of bigger predator fish. And they, see, <laughs> and they see what happens in its brain. I hope it gets fun videos, too. But you know, as I was saying, if you're a zebrafish, this is the golden age of neuroscience. <laughs> but the zebrafish have a couple advantages over humans. Um, one is we can genetically engineer them so that their neurons light up when we hit them at certain frequencies of light. The second is, uh, until they reach adulthood, their skulls are transparent. Right? Makes things a little bit easier. So our skulls, unfortunately, are kind of thick, not transparent. Our gray matter itself is not transparent. And most of us don't carry optogenetic genes that I know of, at any rate. Uh, so we have to do other things in humans. We are making progress, though. This is a proposal from uh, Maharbitz and so on at Berkeley, something called neural dust. Sounds a lot like the technology of Nexus, actually. They would sprinkle tiny, tiny uh, sensors throughout the brain, all across the folds and so on, and those would communicate ultrasonically with base stations that would then communicate ultrasonically within a base station outside the skull. And with this, they could potentially go from 
a few hundred neurons being sampled at a time to thousands or tens of thousands. They haven't built this yet, but they're getting funding to, to go ahead and proceed with this. Or this is the vision of a conformal BCI. This is electrodes on a silk substrate, and it melts into the brain, more or less, and the silk uh, biodegrades over time. This has been built, and they're doing studies in animals right now. Or just a couple months ago, actually, uh, this came out. This is a neural mesh interface. It's an actual picture of the device. And they've injected this into mice. This, this interface is so fine, they can roll it up in a roll, stick that in a syringe, stick the syringe through the skull, so to do something, and then inject the whole thing into the brain and have it spread out over time across the surface of the brain. So none of these are completely non-invasive, but they're heading in that direction, right? It's, it's a lot better than having your skull kind of cut open and things uh, jabbed down into it. Oh, something's wrong with my computer here. Sorry. Actually, nothing's wrong with my computer, but there is this challenge as well, <laughs> which is, I want to animate this. It, if you, um, it's not just the hardware that might be a problem. Right? Who here is excited about a blue screen of death inside their own skull? <laughs> it's, me neither, okay? Or a, a malware warning. <laughs> Or even your antivirus saying, sorry, you can't download that file, it's, it's not trusted. Uh, there are issues, and honestly, these issues are beyond the scope of this talk, mostly. Let's just for a second, though, ask, what if we succeeded? What if we could get something that was sort of like the sci-fi version, where we can make it so that anyone can intake this technology and get millions of neurons sort of put online? What impact would that have on the world? Well, the sort of obvious ones are, hey, we could help people that have been physically uh, traumatized, that can't use their limbs anymore. We could help people with mental maladies, with depression or anxiety. We'd get so much more insight, being able to look at individual neurons and circuits, what's going on inside the brain, instead of a blunt tool of a chemical that spreads everywhere in the brain, and even more throughout the whole rest of the body. Well, what about education? Could we speed up the rate that people can learn things if we could directly interface with their brain? If we could even tap into their brain and know when they were attentive and not attentive, when they were getting something and not getting something. People who have memory problems and so on, really, besides the augmentation, which obviously we have a huge appetite for, since people spend billions of dollars on products to augment their thinking that then don't work at any rate, Right? Society wants this. To me, it still comes down to this ability to communicate. That all of these studies point at a world where people communicate more richly, faster, in higher fidelity, and communicate new sorts of things that they can't really communicate now. A new sort of, form of media, if you will. Okay. Now, all of that, I think, will raise some questions. This is not going to be, if it ever comes to fruition, something that society just accepts without some amount of hand-wringing, right? And some of the questions are really quite legit. Uh, just as the Galilean revolution raised questions about sort of who we were and our place in the universe, I think this will too. And in fact, if you can use technology, whether it's genetic technology or neurotechnology, to change who you are, to change what you like or your attitudes or your personality type, that raises questions of who am I really? Who do I want to be? And that can be a very sort of unmooring experience. Or what about individuality? In a world where we can change what people think or just their basic personality traits, would we become less tolerant of those who are a little different? Would we want to use this technology to uh, tweak them to be more like us? Or would it go the other way around? Would people, especially if they can use this technology temporarily, use it to explore different mental states, new mental states, to switch between their everyday personality type and the personality type they're going to have when they go off on an adventure, for instance? And then there is social justice. So we get into the impact on society as a whole. Maybe 
a mature technology of the brain, or even just better insights into the genetics that drive behavior, will make us a more compassionate society, where we see that someone committed a crime, but we understand why, that might uh, lighten or reduce our urge to uh, punitive measures, right? Make us treat them in a different way. But there's also sort of the converse risk. This is actually an image from an advertisement, right? It's not a shoe store. This is an advertisement for a company that sells uh, criminal uh, anklets, right? If we have the ability to uh, monitor someone or nudge someone, will we be tempted to use it more broadly? Oh, this person has a predilection for violence. We're just going to give them a little tweak. We don't want to jail them. Uh, we're just giving them a little tweak because they just don't do that anymore. Is that worse or better? What if this person hasn't committed a crime yet, pre-crime, but they've got violent tendencies? We're just going to give them a little tweak so that they're not a threat to society. I think these are all sort of valid concerns. And they're not exactly concerns with the technology. They're concerns with how society uses the technology. Okay? Now, that said, we, we've always had this concern about Big Brother. Information technology has always made people worry that we were going to use it to oppress people, to create that uh, sort of stultifying conformity. Right? But there's other pressures. It, can't, it doesn't have to come from the top down. It can come from the marketplace. If a technology is available that allows you to perform better, to learn faster, to be sharper, more creative, but let's say it has some side effects that aren't that pleasant. Will there be economic pressure to adopt these technologies to stay ahead in the rat race? There probably will be. We see that today already with all sorts of things. And then the, the concern that I keep coming back to, that I think is probably of all of these the most legitimate concern, the one that I think about most and how do we stay ahead of, which is the economic concern. Right? Who will be able to afford any technology of human augmentation? Will it be uh, just the rich, or will it be all of us over time? The biggest book of last year, the book I really talked about last year, was uh, Thomas Fichetti's Capital. And it really, independent of the specific model that it raised, it captured the zeitgeist, this concern about the rising wealth of the rich and the not-so-rising wealth of most of society. But I, I want to switch gears to another technology, another form of augmentation, both as a lesson in itself and as an analogy. Because we are all already cyborgs, right? We can all communicate telepathically to people all the way around the world. We augment our memory, remember more things than we possibly ever could have. We have become superhuman in some way without putting anything into our body. And it's possible that brain implant technology will never get there. It's possible genetics will never get that good, but this almost certainly is going to keep augmenting our capabilities, just as it has today, right? It has in large part because of Moore's Law, because every 10 years, the cost of computing drops by a factor of 100. The power consumption of computing drops by a factor of 100. The amount of storage you can have goes up by a factor of 100. The amount of bandwidth you have goes up by a factor of 100. Every decade. Every 20 years, it's a factor of 10,000. Every 30 years, it's a factor of a million. Right? And that's why we all have these incredibly powerful devices in our hands. This is the real cyborg augmentation happening in the world. We are augmented humans already. Right? This is <laughs> who we've become. <laughs> right. Maybe it needs our head to look up and down at the same time. And it's sort of inevitable that this stuff is going to get better, it's going to get more powerful, it's going to get more sophisticated algorithms that act as advisors or life coaches or just to remember uh, your friend's birthday to tell you who it is you're looking at right now if you don't recall their name. Cheaper, faster, better, more available to us at all times. Maybe not even a wearable so much as uh, intimately wearable. This is a prototype LED contact lens. They've got like eight pixels on it so far, but if Moore's Law applies to LED contact lenses, then we'll, we'll get to a billion pixels before too long. Right? So this is really happening. And what does this tell us about the rich and the poor? Right? Remember the digital divide? People hear that term a whole lot today, we don't hear that, because it really was the case that this was a radical technology that only rich could afford, in the sort of the way that, that Piketty would worry about. You all remember Gordon Gecko, right? Many of you know exactly where I'm going with this. 
Here's Gordon Gecko's cell phone. <laughs> now, here is the inventor of the cell phone from Motorola, and here's the stats on that phone that, that Gecko has. Four grand, right? It weighed more than two pounds. It charged lasted for half an hour, and it took 10 hours to charge it up. <laughs> Here is the typical cell phone user around the world now. This is a farmer in the state of Kerala in India. All right, it's the New York Times. Right. How did it go from this to this? Well, that, there's that Moore's Law thing. But more than that, the rich pay through the nose for the latest, greatest thing, or the early adopters pay through the nose for the latest, greatest thing. They get a fairly mediocre, or worse than that, product, and they fund the R&D that drives that technology to the point that it's far better, you know, this is hundreds of times better, a hundred times cheaper, and gets out to billions. Right. By the way, there's a, a post related to this. You should read Elon Musk's post from a few years ago about Tesla's secret plan uh, and how they use uh, $150,000 sports cars to fund the development of the Model S and use that to fund the development of a mass market car. It's the same sort of basic phenomenon. Right? Technology gets cheaper, and people who buy later on have the late mover advantage, if you will. Here, let me make it a little bit more visceral. I went to the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. This is ENIAC on the right, the first digital computer built at UIUC. It occupied a space about the size of this room. On the left is an iPhone 6. If you tried to build uh, an iPhone 6 using ENIAC technology, uh, it would have a footprint larger than the San Francisco Bay Area. It would be several miles tall, and it would consume the entire power output of California. Right? And it still couldn't play Angry Birds or Snapchat or <laughs> take pictures and so on. And it would cost somewhere between 10 and 100 trillion dollars to build iPhone 6 level computing with ENIAC. So we, it, you say, like, we're all walking around with mobile supercomputers. Uh, that's not exactly an exaggeration. That's really what's happening from anyone from a past era. The cost of computing goes to zero. The cost of technology goes to zero. The cost of people does not. But when you're getting something, if it can be mass manufactured, mass produced, it ultimately gets cheaper and cheaper and cheaper over time. Right? That's why today, at the end of last year, we passed half of all adults on the planet on the internet. Right? There are fewer and fewer people who are not connected in any way. There are more cell phone users in sub-Saharan Africa than in Europe and the US combined. In about two years, we expect half a billion smartphone users, not just cell phone users, in India, compared to the 300 million people, you know, men, women, and children, uh, in the United States. Okay? The majority users of technology are people who we thought of as incredibly poor not that long ago. And some of them are incredibly poor. There are more people with cell phones than toilets in Africa because it's true and sad in the same way, but because cell phones have this exponential technology-driven curve of reducing price. So the highest technology overall has been an equalizer much more than it's been a divider. It has had some divisive economic issues too, but it's been primarily something that has leveled the playing field around the world. Right? And that's what I hope that new augmentation technologies might as well. There's other economic concerns. My friend Eric Van Olsen and Andy McAfee have this book. It's an amazing book, The Second Machine Age, about the pros and cons of high tech and AI. And they particularly worry about jobs. You know, what if a computer can do the thing that you can do right now? Okay? And it, in fact, their first book, I think, had a, a great punchy title, Race Against the Machine. But is a human with a genetically amplified ability to learn more or less able to keep their job? Right? Is a human who can digitally connect their brain to a computer uh, more or less able? Right? We think about software and computers as replacing humans, but they also augment humans. And so it might be that as much as racing against the machine, we're also racing with the machine, with the machines, the genetic technologies on our side, and things that a human plus a computer can do that no computer can do on its own. Now, there, I'll give another point on equality here. 
In the, the details of capital, the core assumption here that concerns Piketty is that the return on investment R will be greater than economic growth. That particular model of inequality is that economic growth is going to stop. We're going to stop having new innovations or a new growth of the things that we can do. Okay? But there is reason to believe that humans that are augmented will have more good ideas, will have more innovation, which raises that growth figure, in which case the same uh, inequality doesn't happen. All right? If you think about the printing press, right? the printing press, we know a lot about it, but one of the, the books that I think is most seminal is this book written by Newton, Principia Mathematica. This is where Newton wrote down calculus. The only reason that Newton could write this book is because the printing press had already been around for quite a long time uh, before he was born, and he was able to read hundreds of books written by other philosophers, other scientists, other mathematicians. And then he was sort of an aggregation engine that took them, added a bunch of new ideas, and then spread this book to thousands of others. Right? Every invention in this room, from this screen to air conditioning to your cell phone, exists because the printing press made it easier for us to spread ideas and intersect ideas. That increase of the ability to communicate is what bootstrapped our pace of innovation. Right? Think about it, if you're a computer person, in terms of Metcalfe's law, you have a network, the ability to connect people. The value goes up with the square of the number of people you add. If you have twice as many people, you've got four times as many connections. And that is what innovation scales with. We see this in cities, we see this in countries, we see it in languages, we see it in economies. Right? So more people who are smarter and more intimately connected will produce more good ideas, which in turn accelerates the pace of economic growth. And then the R greater than G potentially gets uh, inverted. We'll see. I would say I'm cautiously optimistic. I'd say that there's reasons for all of these worries to be on our minds and for us to look out for them and see if they happen or not. But there's just as many reasons to hope for uh, great positive outcomes from here. But those positive outcomes are about more than economics. And I'm going to close with this. The first, how many people here followed the Arab Spring closely? The Arab Spring started when police officers in the Egyptian city of Alexandria uh, beat up a kid for having pot. That was videotaped by somebody with a cheap smartphone. That was put on YouTube as a video. And this event started as a Facebook invite for an event to protest police brutality. Now, the Arab Spring hasn't gone where any of us hoped it would go, but that ability to connect had a not authoritarian impact, but a very bottoms-up impact. Right? Right? This sign was posted around then, and I found it uh, uh, pretty insightful, I think, we hope. Or in the US, when you think about the social movements, the outrages that we have, over the things that are happening. Police officers didn't start treating black people worse than white people uh, last year. They didn't start when Twitter was invented. Okay? It's been happening for a long, long time. But what we have now is greater ability to express ourselves in text, in video, in sound, greater ability to rally around things that matter, and that, in turn, has an impact. When there was a killing in police custody in Baltimore, Six police officers were relieved of duty, and one is still in jail, awaiting prosecution for first-degree murder. Right? Now, I can't read the mind of the prosecutor, but I think this happened in large part because of our ability to communicate, because of the outrage that grew on Twitter around this event and around previous events, like Ferguson. If you look at the city of Newark now has the world's or the U.S.'s best civilian commission uh, policing the police. And again, I think that's a response to social media, our newest and best way to uh, communicate as a collective. Now, many places will try to stop this. 
Uh, if you travel to China, it's sort of a, it's an awkward situation sometimes. There's what you can and can't ask. You don't even know beforehand necessarily. But as hard as the Chinese authorities attempt to crack down on communication, uh, they're not entirely successful. In fact, they're not even close to successful. There have been thousands of large protests in China over the last several years, usually on one of two issues, corruption or environmental issues, water quality, air quality, uh, tainted milk. Those are the issues that really uh, draw people out. And they have been successful. Protesters in China have caused the cancellation of factories and chemical facilities that they saw as polluting their local environment. China is very far from democracy, but it's increasingly the case that China has to listen to its people. And this happens when people use their cell phones to coordinate uh, these protests. And in fact, uh, an acquaintance of some of us here uh, got her PhD studying protests in China, and she tells some funny stories. It turns out that when a protest is going to happen and you're going, you might get a text from someone saying, oh, the protest tomorrow has been canceled. Right? It's never been canceled, and everyone knows that. Right? So information technology, even the places that are least free, is helping make people a little bit more free, or at least to find and express their voices. We saw peer-to-peer -peer encrypted chat in Hong Kong. We'll see more. Now, that's not to say that if we digitize our thoughts, we'll be entirely comfortable with everyone who might try to listen to that. Um, I'm not, and I think there are good grounds for us to, to worry and to work on things. But despite the sort of 1984-ish vision of uh, the top of society using information technology to control us, instead we see sort of the opposite. Instead of Big Brother, the U.S. has been swept by movements of compassion and tolerance for differences. And I don't think that there's any way that marriage equality would have happened without greater ability for people around the U.S. to communicate to one another, right? Or the legalization of marijuana. I live in Seattle, so in Washington State in 2012, we got gay marriage and legalized pot, and I thought, this is science fiction right here, right? You, don't, <laughs> you didn't see that coming, it, but it happened, right? This is one of the first information technologies around. This is a Sumerian cuneiform tablet. It's uh, several thousand years old, and this information technology was not a liberator of the people. Why? Because it was in the hands of the 1% of the 1%, and they used it to run their empires, which were empires that were built on the backs of everyone else. And what changed was the democratization of the technology. The plunge in price and the increase in accessibility changed that tremendously. In addition to sparking faster innovation, it allowed people to express strange new things. The first newspapers were created because of the printing press. Right? It allowed philosophers like John Locke to write this treatise that said, maybe we should get along with people who have different religions than us, or look different than us, which was a radical idea at that time, at least as radical as Black Lives Matter. Right? Those ideas would never have happened if printing was only in the hands of kings and emperors. But because everyone had it, it spread. Those ideas were the foundation of the very notion of civil rights and civil liberties. Right? Again, spread from the bottom up in a radical new experiment. And in fact, rather than controlling us, I think every step forward in increasing our ability to communicate has actually driven further increases in our freedoms and our civil rights. It's allowed new voices to be heard. It's allowed us to see people that we never saw before. It's allowed us to literally, well, maybe figuratively, look through the eyes of other people and have compassion for who they are. So on top of all of the awesome science and all of the boosts to economic growth and so on, I'm excited about this technology because I think it might actually make a world where we understand each other and empathize with each other a little bit better. That's what I hope for at any rate. So that's what I got. Thank you very much. It's a delight to be here. Thank you. Do you want to the
a good question, Jim. Excellent. Um, by the way, I couldn't help noticing that an old Microsoft uh, employee was showing us the iPhone 6. <laughs> I, you know, I gave a similar talk in China, actually, and I switched to a Huawei uh, Android phone. Oh, so in, in San Francisco, it's going to be an iPhone. Area, yeah. I understand. In Seattle, you never show that, right? Well, we'll see. <laughs> um, Damon asks, you start out with biotech. Uh, is there a er way that early adopters, that the R&D effect will pay off in biotech? Is, I think... Um, and if not, how would we make this happen? Because one of the major differences between Moore's Law and how it's playing out in the potentially faster acceleration of biotech is that digital has a really low threshold. Um, I remember a brief period in the 60s when uh, secretaries organized against word processors. <laughs> and boy, did that go nowhere. And it was probably because the intellectuals at the time who would normally critique anything new and you know, criticize it couldn't quite bring themselves to use the word processors to criticize digital technology. <laughs> and, and so it, it, it swept in uh, both in terms of kind of easy acceptance. It didn't threaten anything deep like fear about weirdness with genes. And it didn't, as you see, it very rapidly costs so much less, and you got so much reward for kind of getting on that train that uh, as soon as they could, everybody got on the digital divide in one way, as you described perfectly. Biotech is code, it's digital, like Dawkins said, but there's something fundamentally different about access to it. What's, yeah. what's your read on that? So what, what Dawkins didn't say is that biology is spaghetti code. Right. It's really complex, it's very interwoven, and then on top of that, mostly we apply biology to humans, mm -hmm. and there our tolerance for error is pretty small. If you put out some new code on your servers and it crashes, kind of like, oh, that, that sucks, let me fix that. If you put out a new drug and it crashes, that's not good at all. So if you want to look at where I think innovation is fastest, it's where we don't have the degree of perfection required for a human health application. Hmm. So the people in the DIY bio field are doing as much in sort of chemicals and materials and so on. But usually we play out stuff like that on our pets first, as you pointed out with that wonderful diagram of uh, 2,000 generations of making weird dogs. Uh, I would have expected, and, and they're sort of substitute children for lots of people anyway, and there's no end of compassion that we put in it, et cetera. How, how come we aren't screwing around with our pets biologically more? There are some. So uh, since Molly answered the question, I'll, I'll call her out. She's got yeah. GMO fish in her fish tank at home that glow under black, black light. Mm -hmm. And we also made uh, glowing rabbits. It's still kind of tricky, but the research cost is going down. I expect people will want kittens that stay kitten-like through their whole lives, for instance. So, mm -hmm. uh, you heard it here first. It's going to happen. So I, I think we will see more of this with pets. That will be an interesting translation into humans. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that an adorable little baby? Yeah, we're keeping him this way oh. for 60 years. Right? <laughs> My parents might have chosen that for me. Uh, Matt S. says, um, asks, you said it was a mistake not to fund research into genetic manipulation of human embryos. Can you expand a little bit on that? Yeah, so you look at the, the greatest killers of humans in rich countries, heart disease, cancer, uh, Alzheimer's, not a killer, but a, a huge cost. Those, if we could, uh, snip them in the bud by getting rid of those genes, the, the high-risk genes for them, uh, in the womb, that would be more humane and dramatically cheaper than it would be to uh, go through with dealing with that medically later on. An Alzheimer's patient can cost hundreds of thousands of dollars over their lifetime of treatment. Uh, the cost of this sort of procedure should drop to a few thousand dollars, right? So if you know that you're carrying Alzheimer's risk genes, that sort of research is, yeah, like I said, more humane and lower cost for society, ultimately. So do you think, I mean, one of the peculiarities of the world now is there's lots of different parts of the world taking different attitudes toward different technologies. And as you pointed out in China, they at least messed around with the human embryo in embryo form. Uh, so do you expect that 
human applications in biotech are going to go uh, faster in some parts of the world? They will. Uh, Asian cultures just don't have the same squeamishness about mm -hmm. human genetic manipulation in general. Why? Uh, it, people have speculated it's because of sort of the religious background, Buddhism versus uh, Judeo-Christian backgrounds, mm -hmm. but who knows, really. But there was a study about a decade ago, it was in my first book, More Than Human, they asked people in different countries, would you genetically modify your kid to have a, just an advantage, like more intel intelligence? In the U.S., it was like 19% yes, 81% no. In Thailand, I think it was the highest, it was about 80% yes. And China and Japan are also very high. Um, Kevin Kelly asks, does the prospect of the bifurcation of the human species, as you, as you pointed out, that, you know, some of the early war worries about these things are also, though, they're going to head toward conformity, and you indicate, well, actually, <laughs> head more toward more variety. Can the variety go so deep that uh, we'll see in a few generations humans as various as the dogs in that uh, diagram? You know, well, I think it's... Technically possible, I don't see people making that many choices, that radical choices. Mm -hmm. I do think there's, there's sci-fi scenarios that make good sense. Humans mm -hmm. are not well adapted to space at all, for instance, or even a low gravity planet like Mars. We lose bone mass, we can't handle the temperatures, radiation is terrible. Genetic tweaks could make it tremendously easier for someone to survive and thrive in space or on Mars. So that's a one scenario that makes sense to me. Do you know anyone working on that? I know people writing about it, <laughs> <laughs> not actually working on it. Um, Taylor Field asks, and we'll probably come back to this in various angles, what are we advancing toward? Um, I mean, transhuman is a term you use sort of as the ultimate something in your Nexus series. And uh, it's something that comes up a lot. Uh, we've never actually heard humans described as trans apes, but yeah. I suppose that's uh, post apes. Plausible terminology, um, but it's a it's a it's a excuse to not talk about it further term in a way. So, you know, what are we advancing toward? And don't use the word transhuman. But so there is actual evolution in Darwinian sense still happening in humans, but it's it's fairly weak. It's mostly about infectious disease and so on. Um, I think as individuals, people are going to, as a species, we're going to take control of our evolution, but it's not going to be central control. It's going to be family and individual control. And we're going to make some, I think, pretty believable, predictable sort of choices. Better health, less infirmity, longer lives, uh, better ability to learn and adapt to a complex world, probably more fun, more joy. Who wouldn't choose to have a kid that was more joyous rather than less? As a society, I think we are adapting to be or evolving to be a society that has more compassion and more empathy. It's hard to believe in the days of, of Reddit or, not all parts of Reddit are bad, or uh, you know, all sorts of hate storms that happen, but you look around the world, and especially in the U.S., your tolerance, people of different races, different genders, different orientations, is quantitatively just going up and up and up. And I think media has a huge role in that. So one of the speakers in this series was uh, Steven Pinker, who's the Better Angels of Our Nature book, sort of chronicles that expanding circle of empathy that humans have experienced, uh, with novels, with various things is the kind of mind binding, melding, connecting, broadband, uh, looking through the eyes of others, uh, part of that sequence in your view? I think it is. I think a lot of what's happening, and, and I think Pinker is right on, that the world has gotten better and more civilized. I think some of it is that we evolved as members of a tribe. We evolved most of our existence. We were parts of bands of 20 to 50 or 100, maybe. And so anyone that you didn't recognize, anyone that looked different than you, was other and was probably a threat. And so we evolved to just sort of prime on what we saw around us as we grew up and treat everything else as a threat. But now we grow up in cities that are very diverse, and we grow up in a media environment where we see uh, people of different colors and genders and so on. Mm -hmm. And so they no longer look like other. They look like, oh, that must be part of my tribe, too. Uh, something that comes up a lot when we were chatting beforehand, you mentioned it, uh, you're about to get down and, and burrow into uh, another set of science fiction books. 
Uh, actually, is it one book, or do you think trilogies is your mode? We'll see. Yeah, right. Okay. I'll tell hard. you when I get close to the end. <laughs> um, but you mentioned that uh, I asked if it was a different world this time. You said yes, and it uh, had to do with AIs. There's a um, thing going around these days with the term existential threat attached to surfer intelligence, AI, Nick Bostrom, various people. Um, all right, what's your relationship to that? I mean, it, it sounds like great for a novel. It's great for a novel. It's too tempting for a novel. It's a great sci-fi plot, which is why we've seen it since the Terminator and so on. But <clears throat> I do not see an existential risk from AIs as even remotely plausible for a few reasons. The things that we... AI is almost a, a terrible term. I wish we didn't have the term. Because we apply it to a machine learning algorithm that can apply a couple label words to an image, and we apply it to the Terminator. Mm. And they're, they're <laughs> not really... They're not even the same category of things there's very little incentive for us to create, say, a self-driving car that has its own volition and says, no, I don't want to go to that neighborhood. <laughs> so it's, I, I just don't see... And, that's, and that is not going to happen by accident. So I, just, I don't see any real work going into, or a minuscule amount of work going into the kind of AI that would be mm -hmm. sentient and have its own desires. And then 99.99% goes into smarter tools for us. You said not in the next couple of years, but... Uh, <laughs> no, I don't see it on the horizon at all, actually. Okay, so the horizon is, give it a century. Uh, what, okay, the, the way the scenario plays out is that superintelligence gets really, really good, self-augmenting, yeah. uh, focused on uh, some mission that we've given it that is not particularly well contexted, mm -hmm. <laughs> and so in the course of uh, building whatever it thought was the right thing to build, it eliminates humanity and doesn't, isn't even sorry. Uh, the super intelligent paper clip. <laughs> yeah. So you see what heading off that kind of strange runaway thing. I don't see anyone working on things that are likely to turn out to that. Well, there's, there's a few problems in those stories. Right? First, they assume that a paperclip factory, that's one of the classic examples, a paperclip factory that just wants to make more paperclips and thus turns the entire world into raw materials for paperclips. Right? Mm -hmm. But why did we give this thing the ability to go build new factories or to acquire nuclear weapons or whatever it has to do in the plot? We probably didn't. And it's not like... Uh, Software almost never does anything well by accident. Like, you're, you're going to have to debug that scenario really closely. Knock that in stone. <laughs> the other problem is in the stories, there's always just one. Somebody has built one of them that achieves sentience, and there's nothing else that's like 98% as good, or 10,000 other copies of the software running elsewhere that create some sort of ecosystem where that balances it out. There's just mm -hmm. one in uh, a rogue factory, a rogue scientist on an island has built it, didn't tell anyone, mm -hmm. didn't publish their papers, and then it goes mad and, and takes over the world. And I'm guilty of occasionally coming close to this trope in fiction, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I will never do it again, actually. I just, I just think it's bonkers, and there's too much of it. That's what humans are. <laughs> well, here's another one. I, I, there are already AIs among us. There are already post-human intelligences that are smarter than thousands of us, and yet they have not uh, you know, taken over the world. Uh, they're called corporations, right? <laughs> And the Intel has all these processors and all these people, and it's working on making itself smarter, and yet somehow it has not like, uh, turned all of us into chips or something like that. <laughs> so without, I don't an think. without an existential threat, what's your novel about AI going to do to uh, draw us in? Uh, well, I do think that, I really think, I'll recommend again, The Second Machine Age by Ben Olson and McAfee. I think that question of uh, can software take jobs faster than humans can keep up is a big one. And mm -hmm. what is that, how does that affect society? And there's some other nuggets in there that I will not reveal yet. Excellent. Well, I was around in the 1950s when uh, there were several books talking about the leisure crisis that was coming on. Yeah, and uh, what were people going to do? They had no idea. Americans had no idea how to, you know, educate themselves, entertain themselves. They just sit in front of the boob tube and and uh, gradually turn into muck. Um, 
That didn't happen. So John Maynard Keynes, one of the greatest economists of all time, some might say the greatest economist of all time, predicted that by now we would be working about an eight-hour work week. Right? And you might work an eight-hour work week if you wanted a 1920s style quality of life. Mm -hmm. um, but we don't. There's always new things so far. There's always new things that we want that keep us motivated to get jobs and do them and so on. So you think that we'll continue to find ways to do stuff that people want to pay each other to do with or without machines and all these other augmentations? So I, I am not as worried about computers taking away all things that humans might profitably do. I mm -hmm. think they will create more niches that humans are best at. I do think it's a legit worry of uh, when self-driving cars are commonplace, for instance, the truck drivers and taxi drivers who lose their jobs, will those individuals have the right skill set or be able to learn the right skills to fit into the new job niches that exist? So I think this can be a, a big disruption to society without being a post-work scenario. Richard Lee asks, mindful meditation seems to be a large theme throughout the Nexus trilogy. Can you speak to some of the impacts and interactions of neurotech in society, particularly in relation to meditation? Mean, do you meditate? I'm sort of a lapsed meditator. A uh, lapsed one? Yes. Well, you write very vividly about it and make it very attractive. Thank you. I still recall it. Uh, so I'm a, I was a Vipassana meditator. I recommend it highly. Uh, and there's a lot of sort of shown benefits of it. And I'm also fascinated that um, the, the Buddhist leaders, and the Dalai Lama in particular, have really engaged with neuroscience. So I know two mm -hmm. neuroscientists yeah. that have, three now, that have spent time with the Dalai Lama. Uh, they've put Buddhist meditators uh, in brain scanners. And so I find that, in addition to finding it very fulfilling myself, I just find that connection of science and meditation uh, really fascinating. And mullahs and popes have not gone in for that so much. No. <laughs> Different, different approaches. I wonder what happens when they will. Um, the, the meditation angle in the Nexus series is pretty much your handle on what, a, in a, what a, a kind of an expanded mindfulness, where it is multi-mindfulness, shared mindfulness. Um, Say more about how that emerges, something I've seen in no other science fiction. So in, in Nexus, uh, we discover that one group of people that have been using this technology are Buddhist monks that have been taking it and meditating and syncing up with each other uh, as they do. Mm -hmm. um, if you go to a meditation retreat and you're in a room full of people meditating, you, you can hear everyone else breathing. Right? Uh -huh. and you sort of naturally fall into sync. If you go to a yoga class and you do shavasana at the end, uh, you're kind of all in your own heads, but in this together. Uh, philosophically, one of the sort of uh, presumptions of Buddhism is that the separateness of you and I is an illusion, uh -huh. right? and that one of the points enlightenment actually is the realization that everything is just connected. This is a, an artificial boundary. So I wanted to play with what if we actually did have a connection between our brains? Um, how would that affect and amplify this idea of mindfulness and meditating and inspecting your own mind? And it was great fun. I think you've nailed part of the future of how this comes together. Thank yeah. you, Ness. Thank you, Stuart.